Hallelujah. He is our maker. If he is our maker, then he can change things about. Hallelujah. He is turning things about as we speak this morning. He is moving in our midst this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
that the Lord has made. He has blessed us with rain. It is washing away impurities on earth. It is also washing away impurities in our bodies, in our spirits. In the name of Jesus, amen. All is well. Hallelujah. Amen. And without wasting time, I'm going to call for Pastor Sharon to do the word for offering this morning. Hallelujah. Let us honor her with hands this morning. Hallelujah.
and uh, I think it's an insurance that we have to cover the equipment. And then we thank God there is a brother that's faithful every month, although it's no, it hasn't been yet, but most of the time I would say that helps with the cleaning expenses because they sanitize us. All these things just don't come, they come from you guys. So I really thank God for that, for the, the toilet uh, needs, the, the floor and uh, you know and so forth. So I want to thank God that God makes a way, brothers and sisters, and we, I pray that you too will pray and that for us, that we too can go on with our work for God. It's nothing to be shy about. I'd rather say this than to hide it and, you know, we'll be carrying this load. It's a heavy load, brothers and sisters. But we thank God that God helps us. There's days on a Saturday that we are passed to clean the house and we still come in the afternoon to come to the church. Tired as we are. Tired as we are. So I thank God. You know there is a passion. And we thank God that God will make a way with his own way. Praise the Lord. And I'm not for crying or, or complaining. I trust the Lord to make a way with his own way. Hallelujah. The title today is Expect a Harvest. Give and it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be meet, it shall be measured to you again. Hallelujah. This is from Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it shall be given to you. That statement came straight from the mouth of Jesus. We like the part that says given unto you, but there is a give and it shall be given. Yet they are a great many believers who flatly refuse to believe it. In fact, they actually have mistaken, they have the mistaken idea that it's wrong to expect to receive when they give. The truth is, it's wrong not to. What would you think about a farmer who planted seeds and let his crop rot in the field? You think he was a fool, wouldn't you? And if he did it when others were starving, you think he was truly irresponsible. Well, it's just as irresponsible to give financial seeds and ignore the harvest. God promises. If God promises us a harvest. Hallelujah. Nothing is wasted. You may earn a thousand rand and give God ten percent of one thousand of that of that ten thousand. Or you may decide I'll give five percent, five hundred, or two percent, two hundred, or maybe I'll give you twenty rand. I'll just tip God. But God gives you something. He gives us good health, hallelujah. He's given us a promise where it says that uh, by his stripes we healed. So irrespective of the diagnosis, we move with joy. Because we know we are healed. The devil is just messing around with you. Yes. He likes tricks. He's a trickster. But we know we have authority to trample on all words that the devil puts at us. Hallelujah. Well, it's just... Let me just read again. Well, it's just as irresponsible to give financial seeds and ignore the harvest God promised, especially when that harvest could help send the gospel to people who are starving to hear it. We thank God that we have a YouTube channel that we could share gospel, the gospel. It is just as wrong to ignore the key to prosperity that Jesus healed, that Jesus himself gave us as it is to get the two Sorry. It is just as wrong to ignore the key to prosperity that Jesus himself gave us as it is to let a crop rot in the field. God wants us to receive from the financial seeds that we plant. Hallelujah. He wants us to be prepared to require no aid ourselves and to be furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. 2 Corinthians 9 8. We can read that one in our own time. He wants us to have plenty, not so that we can hoard it selfishly, but that we can give it generously. Next time you give, don't be afraid to expect a harvest. Release your faith for the financial rewards Jesus promised. Then when they come, turn right around the plant and plant them again. Keep the flow of giving and receiving going so that the Lord can bless the world through you. Hallelujah. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which sowed divine bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according to his purpose in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful people. But I thank you, brothers and sisters. Every little cent, every one cent, every five cent that you give to the kingdom is something that you give to the kingdom. So we thank God that 
we trust God, can we close our eyes? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, oh God. In everything, God, oh Father, I've said this morning, I thank you for our brothers and sisters, oh God, that you will come and meet their needs, Father, that they will have something in their hands, Father, to give to you also. We thank you, Lord, for those that are unemployed, that, Father, you will give them seed to sow, Father. You will give them a job, oh God, you will meet their needs, Father. And for us, Lord, that have got jobs, we want to thank you for the jobs you've given to us, Father. That we can be a blessing, O oh God, to the work of God. That the work of God will go on to the day, day Jesus comes again. O oh Father, we need to stand before you. We stand, O oh God, worthy before you, Father. O oh Lord, I pray, God, that Lord Jesus, O oh God, that you would bless us, O oh Father. O oh God, that as we give, Father, Lord, there will be no holes in our pockets, O oh Father. That we find, O oh Father, that Lord, we're having problems with other things in lives. That money is running out, God, because you said, Father, the Lord Jesus, O oh God, you will rebuke the devourer of our name's sake, O oh God. We wouldn't be lost in expenses of car maintenance or breakdowns, accidents, O oh Father, in things that are wasting our money, because, God, you said, Lord, you will rebuke the devourer of our name's sake, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, O oh God. We give God all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you, Lord, that we trust that we will keep our doors open to our church, O oh God. Oh, Father, Lord Jesus, oh God, because these doors, oh Father, should never be closed, oh Lord Jesus. I pray that you will hear to our cry, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Father, we bless you, praise you, Father, we declare your Lordship, the Lordship of Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord and Savior in this place. Father, we thank you this morning your grace. Your grace is sufficient for us, O oh God. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your precious word. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the angels of God, O oh Lord, who encamp about us, who minister, O oh Lord God, unto our every need. We thank you this morning for the inspiration of your precious word. Father, we thank you this morning that, Lord, the word that you will speak, O oh Father God, will change us, transform us, renew and revive us, O oh God. I pray, Lord, that faith will come to every person that is under the influence of my voice this morning. Anoint, Lord God, my vocal cords to declare your word to your precious people. Thank you, O oh Lord God, for your great love wherewith you love us. Thank you that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you this morning, Lord, that we can look in the Word of God, and we can look at the mirror of your Word and see who we have truly become in Christ Jesus, your Son. Thank you for the freedom and the liberty that Christ has purchased for us. Thank you that we are redeemed, O Lord, from the curse the name of Jesus. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Where would we be without the precious blood of Jesus? Father, we are not saved by our own works, but we are saved by your grace through faith in Christ Jesus, your Son, our Lord and Savior. So we thank you this morning for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of faith which cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I pray this morning, Lord, that we'll have a more clearer understanding of the word of God. I pray this morning, Lord, that our eyes will be enlightened with the truth of God's word. I pray this morning, O oh God, that God's people will be liberated in Jesus' blessed name. I thank you that there are no limits with you, O oh God. I thank you, Father, that you are El Shaddai, the God of more than enough. I thank you, Lord, that we can depend upon you and not the systems of this world and not men, O oh God. But our dependency and our sufficiency is on you, O oh God. You are the source of all things, O oh God. You are the source of all life, O oh God. We thank you this morning that every word, O oh Lord, that proceeds from your mouth is life unto us, O oh God. In Jesus' blessed name, I 
give you praise, I give you glory, I give you honor, O oh God. I thank you for each and every person that has gathered here this morning. I thank you for each and every person that is joining us by whatever platform or media found. In the name of Jesus, may the grace of God rest mightily upon them. Let the word of God find an entrance, O oh Lord, into their hearts in the name of Jesus. I pray that there will be a transformation, Father God, and that there will be, Lord God, a reformation. In Jesus' blessed name, we give you thanks and we give you praise, glory, honor, and all the worship. In Jesus' wonderful name, all the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, good morning, everybody. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's so good to be in church. Tell your neighbor it's good to be in the house of God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, this morning, I would like to speak to you. Well, I'm going to speak on the subject of the spirit of faith. I began it last week. But I would like to lay special emphasis on the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Thou, I shared with you last week from 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 and I read with you from verse 13. The Apostle Paul speaking to the church, and he says, And since we have the same spirit of faith, one of the things I shared with you last week is that faith is a spirit, and the opposite of faith is fear. So as much as faith is a spirit, fear too is a spirit. Say amen to that. Now, Paul says, and since we have, now let's just personalize this. Say, and since I have, come on, say this with me, and since I have, the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe. And therefore I spoke. I also believe. And therefore speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise me up with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you have received the same spirit of faith according to what is written and that what Paul is quoting there is the book of Psalms, the scripture found recorded in Psalms and since we have, since I have the same spirit of faith, this is what Paul says I believed and therefore I spoke, the Psalm of David I believed and therefore I spoke so you speak what you believe, say amen to that amen. now we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God we understand from Scripture that it is the Holy Spirit who wrote the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit who moved holy men of old to write the Word of God so that we could have the Word of the Creator of this universe right there in the palm of our hands. And it is the same Spirit who desires for you and I to open the Word of God and to study the Word of God and to read the Word of God and meditate upon the Word of God so that that same Spirit who wrote this Word may, Jesus, may impart to us the Spirit of faith. You see that? The same Spirit who wrote this Word. As you read this Word, that same Spirit, you know, Somebody once asked a question and said, you know, how do I grow in the anointing? How do I grow in the anointing? 
It's simple. It's simple. The anointing is the presence of God. But you've got to be in His presence. And God is ever present. And God, as you go into the Word of God and you remain in the Word of God, the Word of God is anointed. So the Bible says the Word of God is quick, it is living, and it is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Come on, talk to me, somebody. As you, as you go into the Word, you begin to see God. God is present in His Word. You read about, we just sang that song, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, all that. When you study the word, you see it's a reality. That is God. Many people, the Bible is a storybook. Or the Bible is just a book of information. No. It's more than that. The Bible is the word of God. The written word. And as you study this word, the same spirit who wrote the word on the pages will write the word in the tablet of your heart and will transform you. And the same spirit who wrote the word will give you revelation of the word. Information is nothing. Tell your neighbor, information is nothing. It's true, information is nothing. Revelation is everything. Because you can have information that Christ wants me to give. You can have that information. He died for my sin. He was bruised for my iniquity. The stripes he bore were for my healing. You can have that information. Because you just know it and you just understand it because you've read it. But until it becomes revelation, and revelation comes when the written word, which is the graphic word of God, becomes to you a rhema word. A rhema word is a spoken word. It's a word that God speaks directly to your spirit. And when rhema comes, revelation comes. And when revelation comes, you can see. Because once you have the revelation that I am healed by the stripes of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, it doesn't matter what diagnosis the doctor may put upon you. I'm here to tell you, when you have revelation, you can override information. Amen. Hallelujah. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We too believe and therefore speak. Say this with me. I have the spirit of faith. I have the spirit of faith. Hallelujah. Amen. When you have the spirit of faith, you don't consider your circumstances. Oh, Jesus. Amen. When you have the spirit of faith, you don't consider circumstances. You don't consider what's happening around you. Because the spirit of faith, it's a bold spirit. You get bold. You don't cower down. You don't moan and complain. Like the ten spies. Oh, the land, the people there, they're bigger than us. And the land swallows up its people. Take note. They say the land swallows up its people. What happened to them when they defied Moses? The ground opened. Remember? And they were swallowed. You see, when you understand the God you serve, when you know Him, and you understand that you are known by Him, and you are in partnership with Him, and God is in partnership with you, the Holy Spirit, it's not, listen, the Holy Spirit is not a dove. It's an insult. Come on, talk to me. 
When the Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus in the form of a dove, it's, it's describing the, it, it is a metaphor. It's describing the manner in which the Holy Spirit descended upon him. He's a gentle spirit. He's a gentle spirit. It's describing the manner in which he descended upon him. For most people today, they look at a dove and they think that's the Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is a person. He's the third person of the Trinity. Our belief is that there is one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is the creator of all, possessor of all. He sent forth His Son to save humanity. To bring reconciliation between himself and humanity. When the Son ascended, Jesus said in the Gospel, It is to your advantage that I go, because if I do not go, the Helper cannot come. So he ascended. He said, I will pray the Father, and he'll send you another Helper, Alice Paracletus. Another of the same kind. Another just as me. He's the spirit of truth. He will take, he says, he will take of what is mine and he'll reveal it unto you. I like that. That's speaking of revelation. Hallelujah. And now the Holy Spirit abides within you and I. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. We understand from scriptures that God has a great and enviable plan for each and every one of us. When I say enviable plan, I mean the people of the world look at you and they envy you. And then they want to know more about you. It prompts them to question what it is about you that makes you different. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. And then you can begin to share with them about Jesus. Come and talk to me. You can tell them about Jesus, what Jesus did for you. Amen. You see, and the plans that God has for you, they are bigger than where you're at. They're far bigger. And to achieve those plans, to achieve them, in order for them to be realized, to be manifested in your life, you need the spirit of faith. Because fear will never get you there. Fear will always keep you at the bottom of the mountain. Faith will cause you to rise to the top of the mountain. Talk to me, somebody. Look at, look at Daniel, thrown into the lion's den. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown into the fiery furnace. You all know what happened. Daniel didn't cry at all. My God, look at the lions. He held his peace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they held their peace. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters in Christ. God has anointed you and I. You're anointed. Tell yourself that I'm anointed of God. You see, because you've received an anointed word. You've received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. The word Christ means anointed. It's, it's the anointed one and he's anointing. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you receive the anointed one and he's anointing. That rests and resides within you now. So you are anointed. 
You may not feel anointed, but God didn't say you must go by your feelings. In Habakkuk 2, God says, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, the just shall live by faith. He didn't ask you to go by what you can see, what you can feel, what you can touch, what you can hear. He didn't ask you to go by your senses. All he asks is that you go by faith. Because it is faith that believes God. It is faith that trusts God. It is faith that hopes against all odds. I shared with you about Abraham last week. When God changed his name to Abraham and introduced himself to the people. And they said, who are you? I'm Abraham. Abraham means father of many nations. I said, he has an old man. His name is Abraham. How many children do you have, Abraham? Oh, none as yet. How foolish. But your name is Abraham. You're father of many nations, but you have nothing to show for it. But Abraham staggered not at the, prom at the promises of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith. He didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't consider their age. He knew that if God promised it, God can bring it to pass. So I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter what you find yourself in. It doesn't matter where you are. You trust God. If God said it, you go by what God said, not what man says. Talk to me, somebody. Now I'm going to share some points with you on the spirit of faith. The first one, I think I touched on it last week, is that every plan and purpose of God is according to His size. Every plan and every purpose of God is according to His size and no human hand can fully deliver it, except his hand. Whatever God plans for your life, whatever God has promised for your life, there's no human hand that can deliver it except the hand of God. Amen. You remember the prophet when he went and he told Ahab that it's going to rain. And he told his servant, go and see, and the servant went, he saw nothing, came back, I saw nothing, go, go look again. Now watch this, here's the prophet of God, he's praying. He tells the king, listen, if you lie to the king, it's like treason, he can kill you. He can take your life. Because there's drought in the land. Now he comes and he says, King Ahab, get ready with your horses and your chariots, for I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. And Ahab must have thought, for three years, it hasn't even rained a drop in the land. You ought to come and tell me I must get ready because there's a sound of rain. You're hearing a sound. I look at the sky. I can see there is no rain. There's not a cloud in sight. It's the scorching heat of the sun. I look at the ground and it is dry. You want to come and tell me that it's going to rain? Then the prophet goes. And he goes to pray. Because listen, he believed and therefore he spoke to the king. At the first time when he spoke to the king, he said to the king, listen king, I'm here to tell you, for a period of three years there will be no rain in this land. He believed it. And he spoke it, and guess what? There was no rain. You with me? Then we find the game. Elijah comes back. Now watch this. Listen. Watch this. When he speaks to the king's servant, when he's coming to tell the king that there's rain coming, the servant looks at Elijah. Elijah is a man of God. Say amen to that. Amen. And you are a child of God. Say amen to that. Amen. You're a child of God. Now watch this. That servant understood the power of the Spirit of God. Because when Elijah said to him, where's King Ahab? Go and call him for me. The servant said, listen, how do I know if I go 
And whilst I'm gone, the Spirit of God does not carry you and take you to another place. And then when the king gets here, you're not here. I'm in the wrong place here, Brother Jimmy. Somebody's not hearing what I'm saying here. The servant says, how do I know if by chance, whilst I'm gone to call the king, the spirit of God, God himself, does not take you from here and transfers you to another place. And when I get back, you're not here. The king will kill me because it's treason. I've just lied to the king. I've mocked the king. I've played games with the king. Now, that in itself ought to be a wow. It ought to be a wow. That the Holy Spirit We need a church in this day and age that is hungry for the Spirit of God. That desires, you know, intimacy with the Spirit of God. There's a man of God from India. You can, if you're looking for a book, it's called Journey to the Sky. It's a story of a powerful man of God. A man by the name of Sadhu Sundar Singh. He was known as the apostle with the bleeding feet. Because Sadhu didn't wear shoes. He walked barefoot. He climbed the Himalayan mountains barefoot. Yet people need hiking boots to climb a mountain today. People need ropes to climb a mountain. But Sadhu climbed barefoot. It's the Holy Spirit that can. Sadhu went up to the Tibetan monks. He was there to preach the gospel. Why they called him the apostle of the bleeding feet is because his, his, his feet were blistered. And they would bleed and he walked. And wherever he walked, he left a trail of blood. But his mission was to make Jesus known. Amen. That was his mission. So the leaders in the Tibetan monk, they took Sadhu and they threw him. They threw him into a pit. They left him there. And there's nobody that came out of that pit alive. Everybody that was thrown into that pit died. There were skeletons there. And they threw Sadhu there. And the next morning, when they had woken up for their cantations, whilst they were busy chanting, when they opened their eyes, when they finished, when they opened their eyes, they were Sadhu in the midst of them. Oh, Jesus. They were Sadhu. The man, they threw him in the pit. A deep pit. And whilst they're chanting and whatever, and when they finish, they open their eyes. The same man they threw in the pit is sitting in front of them. That same man. The same man that they thought was their prisoner. And they'll get rid of him. Sadhu was there. The Spirit of God. While Sadhu was there, the Spirit of God took him out. There's a branch that pulled him out of them and he came into the monastery and he sat there with those monks. Come and talk to me, somebody. Paul and Silas were in the prison. They were singing praises to God. And what happened? There was an earthquake. The prison doors were open. I'm trying to tell you this morning, you must realize who the Holy Spirit is. That's why Jesus said, I'll send you an Elos Paracletos. Elos Paracletos, another of the same kind. Another who, the works that I do, he'll do, but he'll do greater works through you. You see that? It's not us who does the works, it's the Holy Spirit in us that does the works. 
That's why you need to understand that. And once you have a revelation of that, of who you are, of who resides within you, and who you carry in this body, then you'll understand how much power you possess. Power to change the world. God, Jesus. Amen. The book of 1 Kings 8 verse 15 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, and has with his hand fulfilled it. That's Solomon speaking. With his hand. You see, God spoke unto David. He spoke unto David. But he spoke something great unto David. And David understood that it is not a human hand that can bring this through for him. It's only the hand of God. That's why you need to understand the plans that God has for you. The plans that God has revealed to you. Of all that he has in store for your life. It's not going to be done by human hands. It's not going to be done by human strength. It's going to be done by the hand of God. And this same prophet. Who said he's going to reign. He went and he prayed. And he sent his servant. And his servant went and came back. And said, Pastor, I see nothing. He said, go again. The man of God continued to pray. And the servant came back and said, there's nothing. He said, go back again. And so it was, he went back and forth until eventually he came back and said, alas, my master, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand, the size of a man's fist. The hand of God at work now. And he says, go and tell Ahab to get ready because I hear the sound of rain. And Ahab goes, and as Ahab goes with the horses, the Bible says, Elijah got up and he girded his belt around, around his loins. You remember, biblical times he wore those loose robes. So he, you know, he took the robe and he girded, kind of like taking a belt, and girding it up now because he's getting ready to run. So he girded his loins, girded his garments. See, that's why the Bible tells us, gird the loins of your mind. Gird the loins of your mind. Take no thought of what's happening around you. But you get ready for what God is going to do. And that's what he done. As he girded his garment, as he girded the loins of his garment, five he ran. So much, of, the Bible says, and the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he ran. He outran the king's horses. He outran the king's horsemen and the king. They were riding horses. This man was on his feet. Are you getting what I'm saying? What the Spirit of God can do through you and in you. He caused the mere man to outrun horses. Jesus. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Look at it this way. Somebody's driving a Ferrari between here and Durban. You're going to Durban. That person is already in Moira. And you're still here in Newcastle. And all of a sudden, the hand of the Lord comes upon you. You overtake that Ferrari. You bear for it. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. You get there before the Ferrari even gets there. This is bigger than jet fuel, baby. Come on, talk to me. Amen. The power of the Holy Spirit. His Spirit rests and abides within you. Amen. Tell somebody next to you, I'm going to accomplish great things. The second point I want to make is, Every child of God has greater potentials. I didn't say potential as in singular. I said every child of God has greater potentials, plural. 
than the rest of the world. You have greater potentials than the rest of the world. You do greater things than what the rest of the world has done. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. Because God has told us in Scripture the greater works than these will you do. That's what Jesus said. Greater works than these will you do because I go unto the Father. Let me show you something in the book of Psalm 51, verse 11. Psalm 51, verse 11. Psalm of David. Watch what he says here. Do not cast me away from your presence. The presence of God is everything. Even Moses understood it. That's why Moses said to God, he said, if your presence does not go with us, I will not go. You see that? If your presence does not go with us, I will not go. Although God had said, I'm going to give you the land. I've given it to you. I've given everything that's in the land. I've given it to you. Moses still says, no, Lord. Unless you go with us. Unless your presence goes with us. I will not go. Because it's all about his presence. Amen. So David says, watch David. He says, do not cast me away from your presence. And what else? Read the latter part of that. One, two, go. Read the latter part of that verse. And See that? Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Because if the Holy Spirit is not there, you can't do nothing. You cannot accomplish anything without the Holy Spirit. In order, listen, let me put it this way. Without, you can have all the words you want, but without the Holy Spirit, you are pruned. Oh, you've gone quiet. You know it's a prune. Mm -hmm. You ever seen a prune? Mm -hmm. Have you seen a prune? It's dry. Mm -hmm. So without the Holy Spirit, you'll be a dry Christian. You need the words and you need the Holy Spirit in order to live a victorious Christian life. Because you can study all the books you want to in the world, but without a relationship with the Holy Spirit, it will mean nothing. You can even read your Bible as much as you want, but without the Holy Spirit, it will not make sense. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals the word to you. It's the, you know, he takes the word and he opens it to you. There's things the Holy Spirit will teach you about the word that not even I as your pastor can teach you. Jesus help the church this morning. You see Saul, King Saul. King Saul was just an ordinary man. And yet it was said that you will be king. Remember that? It was said that you will be king. How is an ordinary man? How can he become a king? There's never been a king in all of Israel. All of a sudden Saul's father's donkeys go missing. And Saul has to go look for the donkeys. Sometimes, in the pursuit of your God-given destiny, you could be looking for donkeys and you despise it, but you don't know that that assignment or that task will alter and change the course of destiny. Saul goes looking for the donkeys. 
Then the guy that's with him says, wait, there's a man of God here. We can go and inquire. And so, listen, Saul understood. He said, man of God, but how can we go inquire of the man of God and we cannot bring something to the man of God? They said, listen, we have bread. Okay, let's take the bread. And they came to the man of God. And the man of God tells them, listen, your father's donkeys have been found. And then he tells him, he says, listen, you can go read it in 1 Samuel chapter 11. He says, listen, Saul, on your way back, you'll get to a certain place. You'll meet a band of prophets. And it will be when you come in contact with them. Jesus. When you come in contact, when you connect with them, the Spirit of God will come upon you and you'll be changed into a new man. The Spirit of God, what he's saying is when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you'll no longer be ordinary soul, you'll be extraordinary soul. Amen. And so it was. When Saul went, watch it, 1 Samuel 11 verse 11. Oh Jesus, thank you Father. 1 Samuel 11, verse 11. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that has become, that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? You see that? In verse 6 it was said, you'll be turned into a new man. And by his connection with the prophet, the Spirit of God came upon him. He too started prophesying. It's about the presence. You seek his presence. Remember Moses. Moses went up with some people to go and inquire of the Lord. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord, watch, the Holy Spirit people, the Holy Spirit from Genesis to Revelation, you cannot exclude the Holy Spirit. Moses goes up, and whilst they're there, seeking the face of God, the glory of God, the presence of God, descends upon that place. And there were two men that didn't go up with Moses and them, but they stayed in their tents. And these two men began to prophesy. And there were some people that said, you know, that's what happens. When the Holy Spirit starts moving, you're going to start getting some people that are going to be stirred. So they went to Moses. And they said, Moses, these people are busy prophesying. Command them to stop. Moses, oh, I would to God. That all God's people were prophets. And that he would pour his spirit upon them. That's Moses, the words of Moses. Holy Spirit. I spoke to an uncle of mine who lives in the United States last weekend. And he was sharing with me. He says, you know son, he calls me son, he's like a father to me. He says, I've, I've never you know, I've heard of the Holy Spirit, but I never understood fully anything about the Holy Spirit in all my life. Until I watched two sermons by two different men of God, and they were teaching on the Holy Spirit. And I began to apply it. And he says, I really don't know how it works. But it works. And he shared with me in that week, he said, you know, I'll give you an example. There's a check I was waiting for. He's got two homes, one in Canada and one in Pennsylvania. He says there's a check that was sent from Canada. And he had to go and pay it at a specific place in America. And somehow the check was lost. And there was so many holdups. He says, you know, he, he got to a point where he stopped scratching his head over it. And he, he said, I just sat down at my desk in my office and I said, Holy Spirit, I need you now. 
and he committed it to the Holy Spirit. He says the next day, when the mailman came to their home, lo and behold, the check was put in the mailbox. Now he had to go take that check to another place. And he said, he found the people, found out their address, put it onto his GPS, and off he went in his car. And he says he drove. The GPS couldn't even find the place. And then he was so lost, he stopped. In the, he says he was in the middle of nowhere. He just stopped. There were buildings all around. He just stopped. And he says, all I've done, I just said, Holy Spirit, I need you now. Please help me. I need you now. So he picked up the phone and he phones the place that he's supposed to go and pay. He will give the check to him. And he says, when he phones, the people ask him, where are you? He says, man, I'm in the middle of nowhere, but this is more or less where I'm at. He said, sir, do me a favor, drive two blocks down, turn to your right, and you'll find our building there. And he said, he started the car, went two blocks, turned right, and there was the building. Praise God. The Holy Spirit. And I shared with him, I said, you know, that's why Jesus said, I'll send you a helper. You're not alone. Whatever you have to do, listen, God is concerned about every detail of your life. You could be maybe trusting God for a job unemployed and you need to go and hand in your CV somewhere. Pray about it and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to the right place. Maybe sometimes you're handing CVs and you don't hear nothing. Did you commit it to the Holy Spirit? He's your helper. When you know that the Holy Spirit is your helper, it doesn't matter where you find yourself. Oh, Jesus. Listen, Jesus, the Son of God, the Bible says Jesus, the Son of God, when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And then he was led by the Spirit. So, if Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. You with me? So the Holy Spirit came upon him and then he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And by the Spirit of God, he overcame the power of the enemy. That even when he came to a point to die, he had to give up his Spirit. In the beginning, the Spirit of God resided with man. And then God saw man, and he saw that man's heart was wicked. That's wicked. That's why you need the word of God. To expose to you your shortcomings. And his, the Holy Spirit is your helper. Jesus says he'll convict you of sin and righteousness. You missed the mark. He says, uh -uh, you shouldn't have done that. Repent of it. And you repent. And he says, you're righteous. Talk to me. He reminds you of your righteousness. He reminds you that, listen, you can't do that because you're a child of God. You stand in righteousness. You live in righteousness. That's the conviction he's talking about. Hallelujah. And it's the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit who leads us in life. Jesus was led by the Spirit. We too need to be led by the Spirit. Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, did great works to the glory of the Father. We too, by the same Spirit, will do greater works to the glory of God. So that our Heavenly Father can be glorified thereby. Say Amen to that. God 
God saw man's heart, all the devices of his heart were wicked. So God said, my spirit shall not strive with man any longer. So God took his spirit from man. And when he took his spirit from man, man began to age, man began to get sick, man began to feel. Are you hearing what I'm saying? For as long as he had the spirit of God, all those things were far from him. When the enemy comes in as a flood, the spirit of God raises a standard which cannot be met. Come on, talk to me. You see, it's your fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who, in, in times that you find yourself in, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to say stuff. And people will laugh at it, but it's true. I mean, I remember a few years ago, Gloria Copeland, Kenneth Copeland's wife, she said, I will not get flu this season. And everybody laughed at her. She's talking about flu, you're not going to get flu? She said, no, I will not get flu. And she didn't get it. Come on, somebody. The Holy Spirit will prompt you. You see, when that revelation comes, then you understand that nothing, look, the presence of God was in the ark. When they were returning the ark to Jerusalem, they had it on a wagon. And as they were pushing it, one of the wagon wheels hobbled over a stone. And there was a gentleman there who thought it, it looked like the ark was going to fall. So he reached out and he tried to touch it to prevent it from falling. But our God, Jehovah God, does not need human intervention to prove that he's God. God doesn't need you to come and talk to me. He doesn't need a human being to come on. He said to David, if I were hungry, would I tell you? Because you cannot feed me. I created all things. I am the creator of the universe. I am the eternal God. I'm the God. Come and talk to me. I'm the ancient of days. I'm the living God. He doesn't need any help on our side to show that He is God. He just is God. He exists. All that He does is that we believe the need of God so that He can accomplish what it is He desires to do upon the face of the earth. Can you say amen, somebody? Our God is not a stone or a statue that we need to carry from here to there. Our God is omnipresent. He's all over. I can be here in Newcastle. My child can be in Timber too. I can pray here to my God that my God will touch my child wherever they are. To feel His presence I don't need to go and buy a passport and a visa and travel all over the world. His presence is with me. He's with me in my home. He's with me in my car. He's with me in the grocery store. He's with me on the road. He's with me in my workplace. You could be having your last and you find yourself in a supermarket and you look at the prices and you say, but I cannot afford this. God is with you right there in the supermarket. Don't you cry about the price. You say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. You multiply the fish. You multiply the loaves. I know what I'm talking about. I've been there. Pushing your basket. Look at the prices. You can't really afford everything. But you walk round and round the grocery store, trusting God. You pray. It's happened to me many times. Pastor Shannon and I would walk. Need margarine. We walk right past the man's margarine. Looking at all the prices. And we go look at something else to take our mind off it and then we pray. 
Once we back coming round for the second time, continue praying. Then you go another round. Then you find all of a sudden, you hear an announcement, the tension all shoppers. You tell me who's dead. That's the God we serve. You could be trying to make ends meet. You're going to pay your bills. And you're afraid you don't know what the people will say to you. Whilst you're standing in that queue, hold on. You hold on to that substance that you're going to pay your bill with. Take note, I'm not teaching you not to pay your accounts. Be in there, know what it's like. Hold on. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to help me. I trust you for debt cancellation. Remember you're in partnership with him. You see, God cannot work with something that's not his. That's as simple as it is. If you don't make that problem his, it's your problem. As long as it's not his, he can't get involved. But when you say, Lord Jesus, give me favor. Lord Jesus, give me grace. Lord Jesus, help me. You find when you get there, you get favor. I've had places where God will just intervene and the person will say, listen, Mr. Finn, we can give you so much of food. That's the God we serve. Why am I sharing this? It's because you know people look at you and you know, oh, you have it all together. Hey, listen. You've been around a long time. You've been around the block. And there's no textbook that would teach me that. Except the Holy Spirit. Really? There's no human being that could teach me that. You know, we do things in our home that seem crazy to us. It seems like foolishness. But hey, God works. The Word works. You with me? I mean, the Holy Spirit was on Jesus. Jesus could not say it is finished until it was finished. Because even, you know, he carried that cross, he was beaten, he was spat at, he was, you know, he endured everything. And sometimes we as believers, we face that in our lives. People mock you, people club you, they spit upon you, they ridicule you, they slap you. They whip you with words from pillar to post. They break you down and tear you down. That you feel worthless and that you're nothing. Remember one thing. If we are partakers of his resurrection and his glory, we are also partakers of his suffering. It's called the suffering of Christ. When they mocked him, when they spat on him, when they beat him, everything that they did to him, they took the crown of thorns and said, you say that you're a king and they put it on his head. How many times people say to you, oh, you think you're a child of God. You think you're a man of God. You think you're a woman of God. Trying to limit you. Trying to get you out of the way. But they don't know that deep inside there's another spirit that's on the inside. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. You must understand that when they're clobbering you and bring all types of stuff to you, you must understand that there's another spirit on the inside of you. That's why Jesus said if you get slapped on the one cheek, give them the other. You say, hey, listen, what did you say? Uh, I didn't hear you. You said, what about me? You said, what about me? Say what, say what? I, I didn't hear you. 
Is that all that you can come up with? Is that all that you can come up with? Come on, talk to me. I'm not speaking to somebody in this place. Can you not say, listen, is that, is that all you have for me? Come on, man, I'm bigger than that. I'm bigger than that. What else have you got? Smack me there. Come on, you hit like a girl. But I, I'm not saying anything. You understand what I'm saying? But I'm just trying to demonstrate something. The Bible says, like a lamb before it shudders is silent. You open not his mouth. You just help his peace. You just help his peace. Look at Stephen. Remember when the apostle Stephen? When they were stoning him, he held his peace. He just held his peace, and all of a sudden, he saw heaven open and he saw the Son of God seated upon the throne. He saw Jesus. He kept his eyes on Jesus. And all he said to Jesus was, Lord, forgive them not for they know not what they do. That's what I'm talking about. Dr. Phil will not give you that advice. Oprah Winfrey will not give you that advice. Stop watching that trash. Stop listening to that garbage. You just say, I'm not a garbage container. The temple of the Holy Ghost. You see, all that which Jesus endured, we've got to the end. The Bible says he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. Wait, what? He gave up the Holy Spirit. When he gave up the Holy Spirit, now he could identify with humanity. Now he could feel pain. Now he could die. Because the Holy Spirit is the eternal spirit. He's the eternal spirit. Are you getting what I'm saying, child of God? Are you getting what I'm saying? Sister Dolly, in your business, ask the Holy Spirit to help. Brother Jimmy, in your business, ask the Holy Spirit to help. Brother Brandon, Brother Stephen, Brother Mark, ask the Holy Spirit to help you in your work. Please ask Him. Good morning, Holy Spirit. 
Get a hold of it. Read it. There's a book with Pastor Singh. Dr. Singh has written, The Holy Spirit and You. The nine gifts of the Spirit. You know the Holy Spirit comes to give us gifts? I'll touch on that in another sermon. When God allows. And He comes. And He distributes to each one according as He wills. The Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I've drunk alcohol before. Before I got to know the Lord, I drank alcohol. I know what it's like to be drunk with alcohol. You get up the next morning and you waste your money again on something to fix what was it done last night or yesterday. And it still doesn't work. And then I've been drunk with the Holy Spirit. But being drunk with the Spirit cannot even be likened or compared to that. It's beyond description. It's beyond description. And it's true. The Bible says, be not with drunk with wine bearing his excess, but be drunk with the Holy Spirit. And you know what's nice with it? When you're drunk with the Spirit, anyone you come in contact with, they catch it, they catch it, they catch it, they catch it. We attended a service in Durban one New Year's. I couldn't get out of the church. I was so drunk. I couldn't stand. I couldn't. Every time I stood, I fell. Then as a pastor friend that went with us, Pastor Sharon and them were all in the combi, ready to come back, and they sent him to come and fetch me. And as he came, Pastor Mgadi, as he came, he just touched me and he was gone. And there were two of us, drunk with the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, laughing, singing, Somehow they managed to get us into the combi. When we got into the combi, everybody that was there started. That the driver of the combi that we hired, he asked someone in the front, hey, what were they serving in their church? church meeting. He locked her out of the house. In the snow. The morning he opened the door. She came in. She went straight to the kitchen. He thought she's going to fight. She went straight to the kitchen carrying on. When they asked her, what was in your mind? You didn't say anything, didn't do anything. She just said straight. He didn't lock me out. He locked Jesus out. And you know what? Smith Wigglesworth became one of the greatest men of God in the revivals in history, in Christian history. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not our job to change people. I'm probably speaking to some married people this morning. 
It's not your job to change your spouse. Give them to the Creator. Let Him deal with them. Let Him change them. Let Him transform He, he knows best. Because when we try to do it, we mess it up. Very often you find you mess up your marriage, you mess up your home because of that. Leave it to the Holy Spirit. Let Him fix it. Let Him fix your children. Let Him sort it out. Let Him fix your boss. Let Him fix everything. Hallelujah. Come and stand to our feet. Let Him fix it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, you are restored. Thank you, Jesus, you will read home, the broken walls, the breached places, the lives of your people. Thank you, Lord, you'll put, Lord God, all the pieces together in the name of Jesus. People, Lord God, that are, are broken, that have been broken, brought to nothing, you will rebuild, Lord, the ruins. You will rebuild, you will restore, you will revive, oh God. Thank you, Jesus, that revival has come. Revival is here. Renewal is here in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, you visit your people this morning. That you touch their lives. You touch the broken relationships. You touch, Lord God, broken homes. And you bring restoration, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Broken bodies, Lord, you make whole in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, oh God, in the name of Jesus. That, Lord God, there's nothing that is hidden from your sight. You know all things, O oh God. We thank you. O oh Lord, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for your presence in our homes. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, wherever we go, you are with us, Lord. You will never leave us, nor will you forsake us. We thank you for the promise of the Holy Spirit, O oh God. O oh Lord, fill us with your Spirit, O oh Lord. Fill us with your spirit, O oh Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Let it be, Father, less of us and more of Christ. Less of us, more of Christ. We decrease and Christ increase. In the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you now. We bless you now. We praise you and exalt you. Lord, I pray that your hand shall rest upon your people. Lord, you've said in your word that great and mighty works shall they do lord god because of the holy spirit i thank you lord that by your spirit lord you'll open the scriptures to us you'll give us understanding you'll give us enlightenment you'll give us revelation we'll walk lord god in the revelation of your word in jesus name thank you lord we bless you we praise you we exalt you thank you lord for the families lord of this house Thank you, Lord, for those that are partnering with us, Lord, watching us by whatever platform. I pray your grace be upon them, your hand to be upon them. I pray that you prosper them. I pray that it be well with them. I pray that it be well with their children. I, I pray, Lord, that you bless them more and more. That they will become fruitful, Lord, exceedingly fruitful. In the name of Jesus. We give you thanks and we give you praise and glory and honor. We give you all the worship. Lord, oh God, we pray for those that have lost loved ones. I pray that you will comfort and console them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. The ones who are weary, oh God, that you will give them rest in the name of Jesus. Father, those who are trusting you for employment, for promotion, for jobs, Father God, for business, Father, whatever it is, Lord. I pray that you come through. I release your grace upon them in Jesus' name. We believe you, Lord God, for a good report in Jesus' name. It's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit, O oh God. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Now with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each and every one of you both now and forevermore in Jesus blessed name the Lord bless you the Lord keep you the Lord prosper you the Lord cause his face to shine upon you the Lord God of heaven and earth grant you great success in 
Jesus' wonderful name. All God's people say, Amen, 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 and Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I'm looking to the Lord this week. 